Auto. We're on the surface. Okay, we made a good landing. When in September 1962, the President of United States, John F. Kennedy, recited his famous We, we chose, chose to build to go the, to the moon, moon speech. The United States was the country dragging behind greatly in the space race. All the firsts were already being picked off by the Soviet scientists. In 1956, the Soviet Union had launched the first artificial satellite Sputnik 1. Just three years later came the first living being in space. The stray dogs Belka and Strelka picked off the streets of Moscow. The final blow came in 1961 when the Soviet Union launched the first man into space, Yuri Gagarin. It was evident for the Washington authorities that something had to be done to beat the Soviets in this game. The immense budget increases and intelligence warfare that followed the decade culminated in July 1969. Saturn V, the second most powerful rocket in history, launched three men to the direction of the moon. And after four days, six hours and 47 minutes, the first humans on the surface of the moon planted the flag of the United States. This image is what the Soviet Union could never achieve. With the Americans on the moon, the future of the interplanetary human race was very clear. More lunar landings, lunar base modules, lunar resource extraction, and eventually the first interplanetary civilization in the history of mankind. But this never happened. Apollo 17 was the last time we humans landed on the moon. No human has left our planet's orbit since 19th of December 1972. The reason is simple enough to understand. The Apollo program was as astronomically ambitious as it was astronomically expensive. Whilst the US government was willing to put huge amounts of money into the Apollo missions when it was helpful to the space race, research and technological development were not viewed as a priority. Apollo 11 was a political statement in the midst of the space race, and once it had been made, the necessity for more missions to the moon was simply gone. And for almost 50 years, NASA tried unsuccessfully multiple times to relaunch the moon programs. Those attempts always were futile, too expensive, too complex, too unnecessary. Until 2017, when the Artemis mission was signed into law. And this time, everything indicates that we are heading back to the moon. Now I don't want to focus on the details of the mission, as every resource has exhausted this topic already. But to touch it briefly, Artemis 1, which has already completed, along with Artemis 2, which may have already completed depending on when you're watching this, utilize the most powerful rocket ever flown, the Space Launch System, to reach the moon orbit. This part may remind you of the Apollo missions. What makes Artemis very unique, however, is its incorporation of private space companies. In fact, beginning from Artemis 3, Future Artemis missions will fly on SpaceX's Starship. Notice how I said that SLS was the most powerful rocket ever flown? Well, Starship is the most powerful rocket ever developed in the history of mankind. Its power, reusability and refueling potentially make it available to reach the corners of the solar system. By 2024, Artemis missions also plan to launch Lunar Gateway the first planned extraterrestrial space station, an analogue of the ISS for the Moon, with the potential to become an international space docking station for future lunar missions. All of these paves the way for the next step in our civilizational evolution. One of the more important parts of the mission is the Artemis Base Camp, if successful, the first extraterrestrial habitat in history. This base will be located in the southern pole of the moon because of natural shielding against the radiation, as well as the frozen water resources underground. This way, the goal of habitation appears to be a more fundamental part of the modern lunar missions, rather than prestige or a race. But why exactly are we doing this? Well, from a general bird's eye view, 
It's just the fact that all civilizations become either spacefaring or extinct. People, thousands of years in the future, will look back at our age as the humans who did the first step to explore the solar system, the galaxy, and eventually the universe. While this reason is noble and understandable, it is obviously not enough to garner financial support from the US Congress. Two crucial changes helped the Artemis program to take off today instead of yesterday. And the first reason is the People's Republic of China. Ever since China rose to the rank of the second most influential superpower on our planet, the world's two largest economies have become rivals for diplomatic, geopolitical and military influence. The start of the second space race was just a matter of time. And the Chinese lunar exploration program has been growing very quickly. To understand just how much commitment they have, only three countries have successfully operated rovers on the moon. The Soviet Union, the United States and China. China plans to put a Taikonaut on the moon by the beginning of 2030s. And the US wasn't going to allow it to slide off. Now, the disadvantages and advantages of a new space race are very extensively debated among intellectual circles. But a more fundamental reason behind the renewed interest in space, as well as the thing the Chinese lunar missions are specifically looking on, is lunar regolith. NASA and Chinese manned space agency have been very open about their intentions on mining the moon for its resources. The moon has great quantities of rare earth elements and imported metals used in today's electronics. While the transportation costs still make the nations reluctant, the steady decrease in spaceflight prices offer a lot of hope for this direction. After all, mining a dead lunar body without an ecosystem or slave labor is a great alternative to the modern methods of acquiring resources, which are slowly depleting our planet. That's not the most fascinating part. A much more intriguing resource is helium-3. While extremely rare on our planet, the lunar regolith, exposed to huge amounts of radiation, contains approximately 1 million tons of helium-3. It is the most efficient and clean fusion fuel known today. While we have not cracked the code for fusion technology today, in the near future, this resource may become one of the most important for our planet. This is what awaits us for the coming decades. We are living in one of the transitionary ages for man. Like the Apollo generation, perhaps our people will soon become known as the Artemis generation, inspiring millions of future scientists and engineers. After all, space is where our future lies. We are bound to become multiplanetary, scientifically propelled species. When astronaut Bill Anders almost 50 years ago took this picture, he remarked, we set out to explore the moon and instead discovered the Earth. Fine, if I can't have my shoes, Karen can't have her mom.